Uh, folks, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out this evening uh, for this uh, installation of the uh, speaker series here at the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania. I uh, hope you've all been enjoying this beautiful building as much as I have. Uh, I know that there's a large contingent in here from New York City today. Uh, certainly grateful to see everybody, but especially you fellas. I actually grew up in New York. Uh, any Mets fans in the house at all? Uh, no. There we go. That's the spirit. It's all right. We like you anyway. Um, so let's see. As it turns out, though, uh, I didn't uh, join the Masons uh, in New York uh, as I was uh, growing up. I eventually wound up moving to Pittsburgh uh, to go to college and uh, joined up with the Freemasons in 2006. Uh, in 2013, I was master of my lodge. If there's any folks here who, uh, who aren't members, uh, it's kind of the equivalent of being president, I suppose, is a, is a good description uh, of you know, one unit or body. Um, I also got involved with the Scottish Rite Freemasons in the uh, Valley of Pittsburgh, and in 2014 was one of the presiding officers there. Uh, in our Valley of Pittsburgh, they asked the presiding officers to contribute, among other ways, by writing for our magazine. Uh, so I began writing articles, and I was very encouraged by the feedback uh, where our editor asked me to continue writing after my term in office was over. So, that, you know, that was certainly uh, heartening. Um, so I continued writing, and uh, that has uh, segued through various different projects, including doing some public speaking, uh, such as I'm here to uh, share with you folks this evening, as well as uh, some other items that I'm probably going to discuss further after the presentation itself is done. I um, so now we're going to uh, get into our uh, topic, which, as you can see, is the stuff Freemasonry is made of. The Old Testament contains many stories with valuable lessons. When we study it, we tend to focus more on the nature of the interactions between the people in it than some of the details of the physical setting. As time goes on, we also become more and more distant from the era in which the action may have taken place. Notions of an agrarian lifestyle and other social and cultural details of the background may feel foreign to us. An examination of the physical artifacts and materials of the Old Testament may enhance our appreciation of the overall narrative. Uh, next slide, please. For example, uh, we know that in several passages of interest, the Old Testament mentions the acacia tree. In Hebrew, shittah, or plural, shittim. Its wood was used to construct the tabernacle, the traveling house of worship used by the Hebrews when they fled Egypt as cited in Exodus uh, chapter 35, verse 24, as well as the Ark of the Covenant, which contained the tablets uh, with the commandments from God, uh, as written in Exodus chapter 37, verse one, the altar where burnt offerings were made, Exodus 38, one, and other artifacts of great import, in addition to its involvement in the narrative of Masonic ritual. The most common variant in that region of the world is Acacia Seal, the red Acacia, and is believed by some to be the biblical shittim. For instance, according to D.J. Maberly, whose work entitled Plant Book is internationally considered an authoritative text for botanists. On the other hand, David Livingstone wrote in his Missionary Travels, chapter 6, that he believed it was more likely Acacia giraffa, the camel thorn, saying specifically, it is probable that this is the tree of which the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle were constructed as it is reported to be found where the Israelites were at the time these were made. It is an imperishable wood, while that usually pointed out as the shatim or acacia nilotica, soon decays and wants for beauty. Interestingly, the acacia is part of the same family, Fabaceae, bearing long seed pods, as the Gladitia triacanthos, or honey locust, one of the most common trees growing in public in New York City. Interestingly, the acacia, oh, another material referenced routinely in the Old Testament is a particular blue dye for garments. Next slide, please. The Torah records twice in Numbers 1538 and Deuteronomy 2212, the commandment that a Jewish prayer shawl should have threads of this blue color at all four corners. But for a particularly observant Jew, to follow the commandment to the very letter requires that the blue be exactly correct. The blue referenced in the commandment is techelet in Hebrew, and it was supposed to be derived from a sea snail 
Chilazon, the exact identity of which had been lost in the fog of antiquity. One theory put forth was that the Murex snail might be the original Chilazon. There are arguments in favor, such as proposed by Rabbi Isaac Halevi Herzog, the first chief rabbi of the state of Israel, and Menachem Epstein's article in Hakira, the Flatbush Journal of Jewish Law and Thought. And there are arguments against, such as that of Mendel E. Singer, PhD, in the Journal of Halacha and Contemporary Society. In another interesting twist, a study by Otto Elsner of Schenker College in Israel uncovered that Philonotus truculus is a hermaphroditic species that periodically transforms back and forth from male to female, and that the gender, when it's harvested and processed for dye, impacts on the resulting color. This dovetails with the recorded lore that the vital creature for the recipe was only sporadically available, suggesting that the production of techelet is a cousin of the production of Tyrian purple. Since Pliny's writings, literature has described the various beautiful colors produced by the ancient Tyrian purple dyers. Almost all authors accepted the explanation that the various colors were obtained chiefly by mixing various species of the mollusks. In fact, Dibromo indigotin gives reddish purple, and the byproducts that can be formed from the precursors are also reddish. The only mollusk giving blue shade is the masculine trunculus, because it also yields indigotin. It is impossible to obtain from mixtures of species a more bluish color than that from the masculine trunculus. Uh, next slide, please. Speaking of colors, the high priests in Israel wore a breastplate with precious stones in gold settings that represented the 12 tribes of Israel. You may recall the tribes were named for the sons of Jacob, from whom they were each descended. It is a popular bit of imagery perhaps partly for the colorful assortment of gems, and it can be seen depicted and emulated in our York Rite bodies. Although it is established in the text that the stones were arranged in four rows and three columns, it's never made explicit which stones were used to represent which tribe or in what order. But this was the layout as envisioned by Rabbi Bachia ben Asher. Carbuncle for Levi, praise for Simeon, Ruby for Ruben, Pearl for Zebulun, Sapphire for Issachar, Emerald for Judah, Crystal for Gad, Turquoise for Naphtali, Leshem for Dan, Jasper for Benjamin, Onyx for Joseph, and Tarshish or Chrysolite for Asher. Now the identity or translation for the word Leshem remains unclear, and it has been suggested to be either Amber Aventurine, or some member of the Zircon family. The Talmud contains a story that suggests that Moses utilized a mysterious item or animal known as the Shamir to carve the names of the tribes into these gemstones. Next slide, please. Purportedly, it was later located and employed by Solomon to manage the spectacular feat of assembling his temple without any tools of iron. Several biblical scholars concur that the Shamir had to be a one-of-a-kind worm capable of boring through incredibly hard substances. However, there is an interesting alternate hypothesis based in part on the anecdotal detail that the mysterious Shamir was required to be transported in a vessel made of lead. The implication being that perhaps the Shamir was in fact a radioactive substance and its fearsome glance was in fact a veiled reference to alpha radiation. Uh, next slide, please. While we have already spoken of the acacia tree, few trees of the Old Testament are better known than the cedars of Lebanon. We recall it is referenced in the construction of Solomon's temple as well. However, it is interesting to note that while cedars are referenced three times in the passages of Second Chronicles, which described the construction of the temple, it isn't very explicit about how the cedar lumber would have been used. In fact, when we take these three quotes all together, we might even find it quizzical that Solomon needed to request this material from his neighbor at all. In 2 Chronicles 1.15, describing the ascendant King Solomon's success, the king made silver and gold as plentiful in Jerusalem as stones, 
and cedars as plentiful as the sycamores in the Shephala. And yet in Chronicles 2.2, he begins his request by invoking the memory of Hiram's relationship with his father. Solomon sent this message to King Hiram of Tyre. In view of what you did for my father David in sending him cedars to build a palace for his residence. And Solomon goes on to specifically name the species in his request in 2 Chronicles 2.7. Send me cedars, cypress, and algum wood from Lebanon, for I know that your servants are skilled at cutting the trees of Lebanon. And he answers our earlier question, explaining the need for even more timber, considering the uncommon grandeur of the edifice that he has planned. Craftsmen speak of this cedar as apt to be worked by hand, suitable for several different applications, such as interior lining for boxes or chests, building construction, cabinetry, or veneer, and notable for a distinctive sweet fragrance. It is really evocative to imagine that the ancient temple would have been a multi-sensory experience. While it is considered quite durable, further recommending it as a building material, and resistant to most boring insects, it is unfortunately vulnerable to fungal diseases, such as Botrytis uh, bunch rot and Amarilla root rot, as well as one particular insect, the Lebanese cedar shoot moth. In modern times, its population is on the decline and the species is considered vulnerable. As recently as 1999 to 2004, a swarm of web spinning sawfly, or Cephalsia canarensis, posed a dire threat to one of the largest of the remaining 12 cedar groves in Lebanon, even raising concerns in neighboring Cyprus and Syria. In spite of this, it is still in use for both interior and exterior paneling in Southern Europe and the UK such as in the women's clothing store, Toast, in the Chelsea neighborhood of London. The suppliers tout the material's appeal for use in furnishings as well, but they sensibly advise against its use for bedrooms or kitchens where the fragrance might be unwelcome or overpowering. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, sorry, I jumped ahead. Uh, of course, even more central to the story of the construction of Solomon's temple would have been the supply of stone. Inquiry into this material brings us to the story of Zedekiah's cave, the entrance to which is between the Damascus and Herod gates beneath the old city wall of Jerusalem. The Melika limestone there derives its name from the Arabic term meaning kingly or royal, and the term apparently migrated from the jargon of local stonemasons to also be adopted by geologists. The stone can be located in the upper Turonian stage of the Bana Formation, formed in the late Cretaceous era, making it approximately 90 million years old in a stratum about 30 feet thick. While legend has it that the limestone there was first quarried for the purpose of constructing the temple, references to the existence of the natural cave itself predate that. According to the Muslim geographer Al-Makdisi, there is at Jerusalem outside the city a huge cavern. According to what I have heard from learned men, and have also read in books, it leads into the place where lie the people slain by Moses. But there is no surety in this, for apparently it is but a stone quarry, with passages leading therefrom, along which one may go with torches. The narrative that he is likely referring to is one that appears in both the Quran and the Bible, regarding the rebellion led by Korah against Moses and Aaron, his brother. You may recall the passage in Numbers 16.32, where Korah and his followers were punished by being swallowed up by the earth. Although the cave goes by a few other names, this better known one derives from a historical incident during the sixth century BC, when the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar laid siege to the city of Jerusalem. According to the biblical narrative, this was rendered possible because Zedekiah, king of Judah, had fallen out of favor with God, as relayed in Jeremiah 39. Zedekiah attempted to flee by way of this cave, but God sent a stag to follow his progress above the ground, enabling his pursuers to capture him. The story was recorded by the medieval rabbis Shlomo Yitzchak and David Kimhi. Naturally, this cave has held great attraction for Freemasons. A past Grand Master of Kentucky held a ceremony there in 1868. In May of 1873, a meeting was held there by Royal Solomon Mother Lodge number 293, 
the first Masonic Lodge in the Holy Land. And brethren have been holding meetings and ceremonies there ever since. Just this year, the cave has been reopened to the public for tourism. Another material whose importance to society from ancient times up through the present day cannot be overstated is iron. The advent of the Iron Age was a significant milestone for the nation of Israel. Around 3,000 years ago, tools of iron made their preliminary appearance in the region, around the same period as the political shift represented by the formation of the kingdoms of Judah and Israel. Curiously, though, modern science has not yet pinpointed how ancient craftsmen produced their iron. By contrast, for instance, chemical analysis has enabled scientists to identify Cyprus as the hub of production of copper, which was the popular metal immediately preceding iron. But when it comes to iron, while artifacts have been excavated in the region, evidence regarding where the ore was mined or of facilities where the material was smelted and extracted from the ore has been elusive. In February of 2019, Dr. Adi Eliyahu of Ariel University in Israel set out with an international team to attempt to recreate what ancient production might have looked like using low-tech and rustic methods. They sourced iron-rich rocks from the Nekarot and Paran streams in the Negev de desert region. They heated them to a temperature of approximately 900 degrees Fahrenheit in an open fire and rendered them into a fine gravel, which was blended with coal and placed in tall, narrow clay kilns. The kilns were designed with vents, and the researchers surmised that in ancient times, this would have been stoked by leather bellows, wielded by workers, perhaps slaves. It was a laborious process, and in the end, the researchers removed the flag from the furnace by making an opening in it. 77 pounds of ore delivered 16 pounds of iron. Now, their approach was hypothetical. Again, no production facility has ever been uncovered by excavation in Israel. One plausible theory, which is corroborated by the experience of these researchers, is that in order to remove the finished iron from within these smelters, the ancient craftsmen always had to tear them down so that they were only used once, leaving no evidence behind. It's intriguing to note, however, that it has also been conclusively shown that some iron artifacts, which predate any significant smelting activity, were made of iron that fell to earth in meteors such as some of the items present in the tomb of Tutankhamun. The Egyptians had likely attained significant mastery of ironworking in spite of its rarity and the difficulty to obtain it, according to contemporary archaeologists. Where then do we look for our Old Testament connection to iron? We look to Genesis 4, 16 through 22, where we encounter the character of Tubal Cain. The passage reads, so Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain made love to his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Cain was then building a city, and he named it after his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad, and Irad was the father of Mehujael, and Mehujael was the father of Metushael, and Metushael was the father of Lamech. Lamech married two women, one named Adah and the other Zillah. Adah gave birth to Jabal. He was the father of, or one who instructed, those who live in tents and raise livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all who play stringed instruments and pipes. Zillah also had a son, Tubal Cain, who forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. Tubal Cain's sister was Naama. Now, the Cook manuscript would have us believe that these four including Naamah, who somehow anecdotally also became attributed with inventing the art of weaving and associated crafts, became concerned with a prediction by Adam that the world might be decimated by fire or flood, and in an effort to conserve the crafts that they had discovered, endeavored to engrave all of their findings on one pillar of marble, which could not be burned, and duplicated on one of clay, which could not sink. It then goes on to say, that a work called the Polychronicon, written circa 1326 to 1342, records that Pythagoras found one pillar and Hermes Trismegistus found the other. As it turns out, the Polychronicon says no such thing. However, Petrus Comastor, the medieval author, did say in his Historia Scholastica, circa 1173, that the marble one wound up somewhere in Syria. 
it is possible that the account in the Cook manuscript is an accidental corruption of this one. But perhaps I'm wandering off topic. What is the importance or value of recording who was the father or first instructor of any art or science? If we don't have a perfectly accurate historical account, then perhaps the named individual serves as a figurehead or archetype in much the same way as some scholars choose to view the story of Cain and Abel as an allegory about the conflict between settled sedentary farmers and nomadic shepherds. I find it intriguing and ironic to note regarding Tubal Cain's contribution to society that the mastery of working in iron would lead to great advances in both tools that enable us to create and weapons that enable us to destroy. Uh, next slide, please. Another topic of materials in the Torah has piqued my curiosity since the first time I saw it as a child. If you've ever read the book of Numbers, chapter 4, verses 6 through 12, you may have been surprised and confused by a passage that states that the priests were instructed that the Ark of the Covenant should be covered with dolphin skins. Dolphins in the desert. What exactly is going on here? To shed a little more light on the subject, we can turn to Mark Bregman, the Herman and Zelda Bernard Distinguished Professor of Jewish Studies Emeritus at the University of North Carolina in Greensboro. The proper noun used in these passages in Hebrew refers to the skin of the tahash. There appears to be little or no concurrence among scholars, either contemporary or in, or in antiquity, regarding the exact translation of this word tahash. And dolphin is indeed what you will see in most modern translations, although narwhal was more likely the intention. Although they are native to the Arctic, Italian researchers discovered in 2019 that the Mediterranean had once been home to the ancestors of the narwhal and the beluga whale, and they have been known to stray into the Mediterranean in more recent years. It turns out ancient cultures in the Mediterranean region often used dolphin and narwhal skins. However, scholars have debated whether the true identity of the Tahash might have been an antelope, the badger, the goat, or manatee. Even the color of the skin has been contested, with writers suggesting everything from orange to purple. Some Talmudic accounts of the Tahash, however, stray even further into flights of fancy. For example, that it made its skin available on demand when required for covering the tabernacle or mishkan, that the Hebrews brought with them as they traversed the desert, and when no longer required, the animal vanished from the earth, but will reappear in the time of the Messiah in accordance with the passage Ecclesiastes 1.9, that which has been is that which shall be. The tahash also is implied to be of fantastical size, since each, since each skin had to extend the full length of the tabernacle, given in Exodus 28.8 as 30 cubits, or approximately 45 feet. Our study of the Bible and our approach to Freemasonry are often experiences that are targeted at our mental and spiritual faculties. The more that we try to bring our visceral senses to bear, incorporating sights, sounds, smells, and textures, the more immersive our experience can be. Like the characters in Jack Finney's novel, Time and Again, we might aspire to mentally cast ourselves backward in time. In our case, to stand in the footprints where our forefathers, and the craftsmen who came before us stood. I hope that this survey of the physical properties of the Old Testament will augment and enhance your appreciation for these already profound and enlightening stories on both their literal and symbolic levels. Thank you.